strongly coupled uh, polaron and I will explain what that means and uh, our results. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah. okay, so let me start with a slide which I actually owe to Mathieu because he manages to make these very nice pictures. So this is just uh, supposed to be a sketch of what this physical system uh, consists of that we're interested in is so, so the polaron is basically uh, one charged particle. Think of an electron that moves through a medium, uh, and the medium uh, will actually be modeled as a continuum, as uh, is shown here on the left side. But if you zoomed in and look what the medium looks like, right, it might be some sort of crystal, and we're thinking of this as consisting of. Uh, say neutral atoms, but these atoms can be polarized that they become little dipoles due to the presence of the electron charge. Right? So the electron actually polarizes the medium through which it moves. Uh, so this is sketched here on the right side that you imagine that for instance these uh, atoms uh, in this uh, lattice configuration they get slightly displaced, so maybe that the picture is they get slightly squeezed. So effectively they create a dipole moment which again, which sort of creates an electric field and that reacts back to the electron, right? So the electron polarizes the medium and this polarization then acts back uh, on the electron. Uh, so this is just really one particle and the medium uh, and this system together is called the, the polar. Okay? And uh, the model we consider is actually the one of what is called the large polaron, meaning it's really more like the picture on the left side. So you should imagine that the sort of the typical wavelength of the electron is much larger than the space that the left is spacing here. Therefore, we will actually make a continuum approximation and uh, there's just uh, going to be a, a quantum field, so to say, that models this polarization field, uh, which is a continuous field. You don't see the lattice anymore in the model. Okay, so here's the mathematical description. It's called the Froelich model. It goes back to the 1930s, so really the early days uh, of quantum mechanics. So mathematically, right, so we're talking about an electron. So there's the usual uh, one particle Hilbert space L2 of R3. And then the field, the Hilbert space for the field is what is called the Fox space uh, um, over L2, right? So L2 of R3, you could imagine that it's sort of the uh, uh, the space of one phonon, but then you can have arbitrary many phonons and they make up the bosonic Fox space uh, F. So I'm using here the standard uh, notation, so to say, for Fox space, any particular creation annihilation operator in Fox space, I would have to assume that the audience is sort of familiar with those because uh, if I have to start to explain all of this, then I will not get very far in my talk. So here's the uh, Hamiltonian model in the system. So this is the Foley Hamiltonian. So there's just uh, the kinetic energy of the electron is minus the Laplacian. Uh, then there is the field energy. Let me start at the back here. The field energy is actually nothing but the number operator on Fox space. So it counts the number of uh, phonons, uh, so to speak. So if you think um, a more general model would be having some kind of dispersion relation uh, energy E of K, K here, but this is the approximation where E of K is basically constant, and we choose units such that the constant is 1. So the field energy is really just uh, the number of Right, so in the picture before, it's basically at every point in space you have a harmonic oscillator which can be excited until you just count the number of excitations of all these harmonic oscillators. Uh, and we do this in Fourier space, right? so k should so indicate that we're thinking of ak as uh, the annihilation operator for a phonon of momentum k. Of course, you could uh, equivalently use the configuration space picture. Uh, all right. So these are the three terms, and then there is the interaction that couples the two systems. Uh, so uh, there's a, a coupling constant which is usually denoted as square root of alpha uh, and then the coupling function is 1 over k here so here's the annihilation of a phonon of momentum k multiplied by e to the ikx right? so x effectively acts as a multiplication operator in L2 whereas a uh, acts on f so this is uh, the coupling the interaction between the two and the explanation of 1 over k is simply that 1 over k is the Fourier transform of 1 over x squared Right, and 1 over x squared is the Coulomb interaction between a, a, a charge and a dipole. Right, so a monopole dipole interaction is 1 over x squared, and its Fourier transform is 1 over k, so that's why this shows up here. Okay, so this is the standard 
uh, Froelich model, when, as I already said, the A's and the AK's, they are the standard uh, annihilation creation operator satisfying the canonical commutation relation. So uh, that the commutator between A and A dagger is, is, uh, is the delta function. Right, and as I already said, this is really the model of what is in physics usually called the large polaron because it's a continuum approximation for the polarization field. And here's just sort of a technical remark that, uh, so this is actually a perfectly well-defined operator, but uh, you actually have to think a little to figure out what its domain is. It turns out that, I mean, the domain is quite non-trivial, and the reason is that the, uh, the operator here as it stands, so to say, you, you cannot apply it to, say, a, a usual, uh, say, uh, what you might be used to, a, a dense set of vectors in Fox space, maybe consisting only of finitely many mo phonons. These are not in the domain simply because 1 over k is not L2. Right? So if you just imagine applying this operator to the vacuum, you create one phonon with wave function 1 over k, right, which is not in L2. So this operator is a bit formal, but you can, for instance, simply convince yourself that this is well defined in a quadratic form sense since it's bounded from below, and simply because of that it defines a unique uh, self adjoint operator. But you can actually also figure out what its domain is, but it depends very non-trivially on alpha. In particular, the domain of this operator has actually no intersection with the, so the domain at alpha equals zero, which would be the trivial non-interacting model. Um, but in any case, it's a well, perfectly well-defined self-adjoint operator. It's, it's, if you want a toy model of quantum field theory, right, because you have one uh, quantum mechanical particle but coupled to uh, a quantum field. And there's such, actually, there are many models of this kind, right, There's, for instance, the Nelson model as, as sort of a toy model of quantum electrodynamics, but there are many other models. Um, now, what I will be interested in is actually uh, the strong coupling limit. So this is uh, quite... Uh, maybe sp specific to this model, as I will explain, that this actually can be analyzed for large coupling, right? Uh, otherwise, often in quantum field theory, uh, one really only has control over things for very small coupling, one can do some perturbative expansion. But here, actually, it turns out that uh, large coupling, uh, that there's something one can say that large coupling, in some sense, the system actually simplifies for large coupling, and effectively, the quantum field uh, becomes a classical field. And to see this is actually, in some sense, just a change of variables. Uh, so um, here it's explicitly written out. I mean, if you rescale variables, the, the electron position you rescale by 1 over alpha, right? That's square root alpha was this coupling constant. And you replace the field operator AK by this particular form. So you rescale K, but you also multiply the operator with alpha to minus 2. Uh, and if you just make this, make this transformation, you see that the Hamiltonian is up to a trivial multiplicative factor alpha squared, well, equal to what we had before, except that there's no more alpha. So in some sense, the square root of alpha has completely disappeared. Uh, there was a multi all the terms, in other words, of the Hamiltonian scale like alpha squared, so we can pull them out. That's why I divide it with alpha squared. And we get something that formally doesn't depend on alpha. However, that's not quite true because these new operators that are defined here in this transformation, the new field operators, they satisfy a rescaled canonical commutation relations, namely the alpha squared still appears. Oops. Uh, So it still appears here in the canonical commutation relations of the field operator. So in other words, if you want to, I cheat it right, by saying it doesn't depend on alpha because I just absorb the alpha into the A, which I can do. But it, it, it just then, of course, the A's are not the usual A's. They are rescaled A's satisfying these rescaled canonical commutation relations. And physically, you can think of something like an effective Planck's constant appearing, right? Because if you actually put in units, there should really be a Planck's constant in front of the delta function. Uh, in the, in the commutation relation. So effectively, uh, alpha to the minus 2 appears uh, as, an, a, as a Planck's constant for the field. Right? So therefore, naturally, if you look at very large alpha, you might say, well, the field becomes commutative. So that means it becomes a classical field. Right? So the large alpha limit is sort of a classical limit, or I mean, partially classical, because the electron is still quantum, but the field becomes classical. So let's look at this classical approximation, which simply amounts to replacing the field operators by functions. Right? So wherever you see an AK, you would just think of this as a number, call it ZK. And of course, the AK dagger, which is the complex conjugate of this number. And then uh, it will be convenient to express things actually in X space then. So the Fourier transform of this ZK I denote by phi. 
Okay, so that's the 5x, so it's a complex value function, just it's sort of the classical approximation to the field in x space, not in k space. Okay, so let's do that. Let's uh, just uh, plug it in, right? And actually, we take the expectation value in uh, some electron wave function psi, and then we end up with what uh, you could call the, the PK functional because this was written down by uh, PK already, I think, in the 40s in the, in, the, in the physics literature, maybe not in that notation, but effectively just a classical approximation, right? So, what, what is here is just, well, here's the kinetic energy of the electron, but we haven't done anything. Uh, now here you see I wrote in an x space, the, one, the multiplication with 1 over k right, becomes a convolution with 1 over x squared. And we, what was the field here now is it just becomes a classical field. And actually only the real part appears right, because there was something plus its complex conjugate. So effectively the real part of the file appears here. So you see effectively you have an electron that interacts with an external potential which is given by the convolution of the real part of the field with 1 over x squared. Right? And the field energy, what was the A dagger A, of course, just becomes the phi squared. Right? So the, the, the L2 norm of phi is the energy of the of field in this classical approximation. Uh, now, if we look at the corresponding dynamics, right? I mean, on the quantum level, of course, dynamics right, is just turning as equation. I mean, you have a, you, the unitary group generated by the self adjoint operator, e to the minus ith. Uh, on the classical level, there's also natural dynamics, and these are called uh, the lambda a Pekar equation. So in other words, you can think of this energy here as actually being uh, a, a Hamiltonian of a dynamical system. And if you write down the corresponding sort of uh, Hamilton's equations, these are the lambda Pekar equations. Right? So there are two equations here. One it looks like a Schrodinger equation, right? So it's IDT psi is equal to sort of the effective Hamiltonian, right? Which is just the Laplacian and this external potential, which is generated by the the field, the real part of the, of the field convolve with one of x squared. And then there's also an evolution equation for phi, which is simply uh, here, it's, it's more like a wave equation, it's, it's i alpha squared dt phi is phi minus the source term, and the source term is a sort of psi squared, the electron density convolved with one of x squared. And I should say, for those of you who actually pay careful attention, there are all kinds of two, twos and two pi's and stuff missing, which I just swept under the rug so that the formulas look a bit nicer. Okay. Uh, so uh, you might wonder, where does the alpha squared appear? This looks a bit artificial. Of course, it is sort of artificial on the purely classical level, if you want, because the energy, the Hamiltonian, doesn't depend on alpha, but sort of the... Uh, the if you want the symplectic form does. The alpha is in the symplectic form, the, the, si, si, simply the, 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 the Poisson bracket becomes an alpha squared, right? The classical approximation is that if the commutator, you write the Poisson bracket, but the commutator had an alpha to the minus two for the field. So you should also do the same thing on the classical level, put the alpha to the minus two there, and that's the reason for the alpha squared appearing here in front of the time derivative of phi, whereas there's no alpha squared for, in front of the time of derivative of psi, because uh, right, the commutator of psi, I mean, ordinary quantum mechanics, there was, not, there was no alpha dependence. Right, so this sort of sets a different uh, time scale if you want. Of course, if you find this argument uh, too hand wavy, you could have also just did, done the classical approximation in the origin variables without rescaling and rescale afterwards, and of course, you would end up with the exact same equation. So these are the lambda Pekar equations. And you see, we, at the event, we're going to be interested in large alpha because we want, to, uh, we want to investigate the validity of these equations, sort of, or their derivation from the quantum problem. So large alpha, I mean, the equations themselves still depend on alpha, right? They have this uh, sort of adiabatic nature, a separation of time scales, right? You see from the alpha squared appearing here that the natural time scale for the phi, for the polarization field, is alpha squared, right? So it will move only on a sort of time scale of alpha squared naturally, whereas the psi sort of moves on the time scale of order one, so it's much, much faster. So it's sort of this adiabatic uh, separation of time scales. You have the fast degrees of freedom, that's the electron, and the slow degrees of freedom, that's the field. Okay. Um, now, to connect right classical and quantum, I said, well, one, thing to, one way to do it is just to pretend that the field operators are functions. But another way of doing it without saying that is actually to look at specific states, namely coherent states. Right? So in particular, if you look at product states, so I'm now back on the quantum level, right? so electron and field. If you look at product states, psi for the electron, and a coherent state for the field. Right? So coherent states, you can 
think of it as a vial operator that's the W here applied to the vacuum. And just because of my V scaling of the variables, there's an alpha squared naturally appearing. Uh, or you define it this way the coherent state is simply an eigenstate of all the uh, annihilation operators. Right? This is the one that effectively makes the field. Uh, classical, right? Because it's in the state where the AK does not fluctuate at all. AK applied to the state is ZK. Uh, uh, and as I and to remind you, the ZK altogether, that's equivalent to the phi, because the phi is just the Fourier transform of the function C of K. Okay? So if you take such specific product states and you evaluate the energy in the quantum problem, right, for the Fourier Hamiltonian, you actually get exactly the Fekar functional. So that's another way to motivate the classical approximation. You look at very specific, sort of the most classical states you could think of in the quantum setting, and these are exactly product states where the field is described by a coherent state. Coherent states, in some sense, are the most classical states you can write down in the quantum setting. Okay, so uh, therefore, uh, so here is sort of the connection of the to a dynamic setting of what we want to explore, right? So we want to somehow investigate the emergence of these lambda or Fekar equations for the actual Schrodinger dynamics, and specifically, you can ask the question: Suppose I start with one of these very classical states, a product state of an electron and a coherent state. I apply to it the Schrodinger dynamics, which simply means right, the semigroup, uh, sorry, the group e to the minus i t. Uh, times h. And in what sense is it true that this state is still approximately classical? And if it is, what should it be? Well, it should be the corresponding classical state corresponding to the uh, time evolved classical data. So to say you have the psi and the phi, and you should evolve them in time according to the lambda pekar equations. Right? That's sort of the, that would be the, the classical approximation, so to say, would be exactly to say, well, it stays roughly a classical state. Uh, but, of course, you have to evolve both psi and phi according to this classical Lenny lambda pekar equations. Okay, so this would be the goal. Uh, now, to explain in what sense this is true, however, I, I sort of need a little bit more uh, uh, machinery, which I will explain uh, next. And actually, before I do that, uh, maybe partly as a motivation, I want to actually look at the statics first. So, so not, uh, forget about dynamics for the moment. Let's just look at statics. In particular, let's look at the ground states. Right? So uh, ground states simply means right, the lowest, the, the infimum of the spectrum of the uh, Froelich Hamiltonian. And similarly, for the classical approximation, you can define the ground state energy, which is simply the, the, the minimum of the uh, classical functional. And so you minimize the overall phi and uh, overall psi, of course, subject to the uh, normalization condition integral psi squared is always equal to 1. Okay, so let's call the classical energy EP, right? That's just some number, right? We, we, there's no, more, no other parameters, so this is just some number EP. And what is true and was first proved uh, by Donska and Varadan in the 80s is that indeed sort of the classical limit is exact. Uh, in, sorry, in the strong coupling, I mean, the strong coupling limit is sort of a classical limit. The classical approximation becomes exact in the strong coupling limit, which, in my, with my sort of definition, right of the rescale Froelich Hamiltonian H alpha simply means that the grounded energy of the Froelich Hamiltonian, as alpha goes to infinity, converges to the classical approximation. Okay, this is sort of not surprising, but if you think of it uh, in terms of alpha effectively appearing as, as, as a as the Planck's constant in the commutator, but it's still actually, so turns out, it's not sort of completely straightforward to prove this, actually. And Donsky and Varadan actually had a very, uh, I would say, from my perspective, of course, it's all relative, complicated proof. They looked at the sort of path integrals. Uh, they, they looked at the sort of path integral formulation of the ground state energy, which you could do via sort of the, the feynman katz formula, uh, and use sort of large deviation theory on, the, on this path measure to, to establish this uh, limit. Uh, later in the 90s, there was a, from my perspective, much simpler proof by, by, by Lieb and Thomas, who used sort of operator techniques. And in particular, they actually gave sort of a, a rigorous error bound, so to say. I mean, the, only a lower bound you need to prove, right? Because by what I said, uh, the classical energy is always an upper bound to the quantum energy because it just corresponds to plugging in these classical coherent states. Uh, and uh, so, so the lower bound is really the interesting thing. And, and Lieben Thomas proved an explicit lower bound on the difference in terms of some power uh, of alpha. Um, now, for what I want to say 
later for the dynamics, actually it would be important to look at co corrections to this, which you could interpret as quantum fluctuations, right? So here we have the purely classical limit. The field becomes classical. It just you know, takes a certain value. But of course, in quantum mechanics, right, it, it, it can't because of the uncertainty principle. So it re really fluctuates a little. And so to leading order, you would sort of just take the sort of harmonic approximation to these fluctuations. Uh, and this sort of naturally leads to a prediction of what the leading order correction in this asymptotics should be. And to formulate it, uh, let me do the following. So, so here's the Becker energy, right? Let me minimize over Psi. Uh, turns out fluctuations in Psi are not important, right? Because Psi is the fast degree of freedom. So Psi will in some sense always uh, can instantaneously sort of be in the minimum. Its fluctuations will not contribute to the, to the leading or the correction. So let's minimize over Psi. And, that, that, and if you recall what the functional was, I could actually display it. Simply write that the Psi dependence is just quadratic, right? It's just the Schrodinger operator minus Laplacian plus this external field generated by the polarization. Right? So if you minimize over Psi, it just says you take the infimum of the spectrum of this Schrodinger operator, right? which is, of course, a function of the polarization field phi. Right, so that's what is written here. If you minimize the psi, you get the infimum of the spectrum of this effective shielding operator as a function of phi. And there's, of course, still the field energy into go phi squared. Okay. Now, uh, expand this functional around the minimizer. Right? So in other words, compute the Hessian of this functional, which you can explicitly do, right? Because it's sort of just second order perturbation theory. You have a homotomy that depends linearly on phi. Now you want to do a second derivative, right? So you do second order perturbation theory. Here, uh, in phi squared, of course, it's a trivial Hessian, just the identity. So uh, that's the HP here. That's the Hessian of the function. Right? So you imagine you expand around the minimizer, which I call phi p. Uh, to say second order, and that defines this Hessian. Okay, and this is something you can explicitly compute. Uh, I didn't write down the formula for it because I think, uh, well, actually, effectively, I do later. But in any case, it's not so important how precise it looks. That's the definition of the Hessian. It's some positive operator, but simply because I expand around the minimum, so it better be positive. And you can also check that it's less than one, simply because the one comes from the second derivative of the field energy, and here you see. This thing is concave in phi, right? You take the infimum of something linear, so it's concave, so the second derivative will be negative. So the Hessian has to be less than 1. Okay. Uh, the Hessian has some zero modes that have simply to do with the symmetries of the problem, right? Because the whole problem is translation invariant. So there's, of course, not just one minimizer. There's a whole manifold of minimizers given by translations. But actually, these are the only ones. But this is actually also a non-trivial and interesting problem just in analysis to, to prove that minimizers for these classical functionals are unique up to the symmetries of the problem, namely translations. So this was proved by Lieb in the 70s. Uh, and actually, Lenzmann had a very nice work in 2009 where he sort of uh, went beyond uniqueness and actually also proved that the Hessian is sort of non-degenerate beyond the trivial zero modes you get from translation invariants. So in this language here, it means that uh, the Hessian here has only three zero modes coming from the translations, but no others. Except for the trivial zero modes you have from translation variants, there is a gap. Uh, but this will actually not be important for what I say in the following, so this is more of a side remark. Okay, so, but now if you believe that, you see, if you sort of think of approximating this function, sort of uh, a phi, by this quadratic one, but then you have, now you can go back to the quantum. In some sense, you can re-quantize. You have a quadratic theory, so of course you can compute everything. It's just harmonic oscillators. So the, that leads to the prediction, which I formulated here as a conjecture, because it's still not proved, that the next order term in the ground state energy uh, of the Froelich model is exactly the sum of the ground state energies of all these oscillators you get from this quadratic approximation, which uh, you can convince yourself is this uh, square root of the Hessian, right, simply because uh, if you have a harmonic oscillator, right, p squared plus omega squared x squared, it's the omega that's the ground state energy up to a factor of one half, or actually up to a factor of one over two alpha squared, right, because alpha squared comes from the commutator. Uh, so there's the square root of the Hessian appearing, and you can convince yourself the one you have to subtract, that's sort of the trivial one coming from the field energy. Actually, it's this term that's trace class. So the Hessian is sort of a uh, trace class perturbation of the identity. So this, this object by itself uh, makes sense, whereas each individual term, of course, would be infinite because of the infinitely many modes. Uh, 
and, uh, and this would be sort of a natural conjecture. And you can actually find this prediction in the, in the, in the, in the physics literature. Um, we don't know how to prove it for various reasons that we don't have time to go into that. Here I just mentioned it sort of as an advertisement, as a side remark that we have proved this in sort of simpler settings where in some sense we get rid of the infrared problem coming from the translation variants and confine the system. So if you take the very same problem but you confine it, say, to a finite nice domain with theoretically boundary conditions, that's what we first stood, did with, with Ruth and Frank, uh, actually a couple of years back, but it took a while to get published. Uh, or we can actually do the, same, do the same problem still in the translation variant setting but putting everything on a torus. Uh, that's what I recently did with my student Dario Filigiangeli. Uh, and uh, there we could actually prove these two term asymptotics in the graph state energy. Okay, but this is not really the main uh, uh, topic of my talk. I, I want to, to mainly use it to actually motivate the introduction of this sort of quadratic fluctuation Hamiltonian, if you want. The Hamiltonian that describes the quantum fluctuations, which is exactly the quantization of this Hessian. Right? Uh, uh, quantization of this quadratic uh, of this Hessian, which naturally is a, is a quadratic Hamiltonian, a Bogoliubov Hamiltonian, uh, if you want. Right? And here it's explicitly defined once more. Uh, actually, the I mean the n that's just the number operator, right? That was in the first place there. We hadn't we didn't have to do anything with it. It was already quadratic. And here's another quadratic Hamiltonian, uh, a sub phi. So phi is the classical field. Um, and, okay, here's the definition. Let me maybe start uh, at the end. So, H phi here, I denote the, Schrodinger, the effective Schrodinger operator that acts on the electron, right? The Laplacian, and then the polarization field, uh, uh, the, the external potential created by the polarization field, so the real part of phi convolved with 1 over x squared, right? So, phi is a parameter. H depends on phi of the parameter. The ground state energy of H phi I denote by E phi, and the ground state by psi sub phi. Right? Everything depends on the parameter phi. And we also need the resolvent, so uh, if we just uh, orthogonal to the ground state space, right? if there's an energy gap, then, we, then this reduced resolvent exists, just the inverse of H minus E orthogonal to the ground state. Okay, that's what I call R phi here. And that's what we need for the quantization, right? So we take R phi, we multiply it by the field operator, which depends on the parameter x, right? So v dot, that means you take the field operator, right? a plus a dagger, for the function f, which still depends on the parameter x, namely this way, it's this 1 over x minus y squared, right? So this is, if you want, on the electron level, this is a multiplication operator, but it's sort of a, 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 a field operator value to function. Right, and here you put the same field operator value function, and then you just take the L2 inner product with this psi phi, the ground state of H phi. Right, so this is a certain now operator depending on, uh, on phi. Okay, and it's a quadratic operator uh, on the Fox space. And this is sort of the natural quantum fluctuation Hamiltonian. If I expand the functional around the minimum quadratically, this is the one that describes that this is, these are my infinitely many harmonic oscillators that I was talking about, describing the fluctuations about the classical uh, minimum. Well, so here we need the minimizer, right? So phi is phi p, that means we expand it around the minimum, naturally. But this whole definition actually works not just at the minimum, I can define this for any classical value phi, as long as all these expressions make sense. So basically as long as this operator h sub phi here has uh, a ground state and a gap, with a gap above it, right? So as long as it has such a thing, so as long as phi is not too crazy, then this will always will exist, and we can define this quadratic uh, Hamilton. Okay, and I will need to, I will need it now to state actually the main theorem, uh, which concerns the dynamics, okay? And it, this goes as follows. So here's the main theorem. So this is joint work uh, with Nikolai Leopold, uh, David Mitruskas, Simone Rademacher, and Benjamin Schlein. Uh, 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 and, and it says the following, right? So, so here's the problem again, as I already explained. We want to do the time evolution, right? The Schrodinger time evolution generated by this uh, Foley Hamiltonian on suitable initial states, right? So we take the most classical initial states, uh, so a coherent state for the uh, phonons and right, with the product state, the electron, 
Uh, but now this is not completely arbitrary, so the phi zero, the polarization field, the classical one, we pick it in such a way that everything I just explained on my previous slide makes sense. So in other words, the ground state energy of the effective Schrodinger operator should be negative, right? Because then I have a ground state, it's unique, I have a gap above, so all the objects are just defined <coughs> in this sense uh, under this condition. Okay. Uh, now, the electron wave function here is not arbitrary, but actually I take it to be exactly the ground state of the corresponding Schrodinger operator, right? So you should imagine phi zero is the configuration of my polarization field. It can be pretty arbitrary, but it has to be it has to be such that the corresponding potential that the electron sees allows for a bound state. Right? So the electron is actually bound by the polarization field profile. Okay, and we put it exactly in its ground state here. Right? That's the psi sub phi. Right? I just defined this. This was the ground state of H sub phi with ground state energy E sub phi. Phi is pretty arbitrary, but psi has to be always in the ground state of the corresponding phi, right? And now we apply the uh, Froelich uh, time evolution, okay? And the claim is now that, indeed, we essentially still stay in such a classical state, but not quite, right? So I, I explain that here. So there's a trivial phase factor, which I don't care. I mean, it's explicit, that, but this is not important. Here's a still a product structure, right? So psi t is simply the solution uh, of the lambda pair car equations, and the same thing with phi t. Right? So psi t and phi t, this indeed solves the lambda pair car equations with this initial condition, right? phi, phi zero for the polarization field and the corresponding psi phi zero for the electron. Okay? Uh, the reason I didn't write it with a coherent state is that actually it's not quite a coherent state. Here's still the vial operator applied to, but not the vacuum. It turns out you have to modify this omega. It's not the vacuum, but rather you actually have to do the fluctuation dynamics for this vacuum vector, so to say. So initially it wasn't a vacuum by choice, but actually this will still evolve in time. And here's, here it's written how it evolves in time, namely exactly by this sort of Bogolubov dynamics, right? It's, it, it evolves in time according to a quadratic operator, this n minus a, right? A, you see, depends parametrically on the classical solution phi t uh, of the lambda baker equations. So uh, this is just showing the dynamics for an effective quadratic operator. It's just the dynamics on Fox space, right? The electron is out of the picture. It's, it's simply the fluctuation dynamics of the field that sort of fluctuates naturally like all, all these harmonic oscillators around the classical value. So if one takes this into account this way, then we have a theory that indeed these states are very close uh, the, uh, the difference in norm, right? So this is a norm of the full Hilbert space of electron and a phonon field. Uh, this is actually bounded by a constant over alpha, right? Alpha is going to be large, so this is basically saying these states cannot be distinguished, so to say, even on, on, on the, in, in the natural Hilbert space norm. Right? But this would not be true if you didn't take the quantum fluctuations into account. If you left this omega sub t here always to be omega in the vacuum, then uh, the theorem would actually not be true. Right? So, you, so, so in order to get a, a, a true approximation really on the full Hilbert space, sort of taking all the degrees of freedom into account, then you have to uh, take into account these, quark, these, these quantum fluctuations. Uh, the time scale here, right, time is also not arbitrary, but time is of order alpha squared. Right? That's the important thing. Oops, I have a hard time marking this thing for some reason, but okay, you see it here. Right? So the, this holds for all times of order alpha squared. Right? So the statement is, there is a T0, right, which will depend on the initial condition phi 0, such that for all times up to alpha squared T0, this uh, estimate is true. So this is the natural time scale, right, as I explained, because the classical, the lambda becker equations, tell you that the phi moves on a time scale of order alpha squared. So that's the natural time scale where things actually uh, move. Uh, so this is our main theorem. There is a simpler formulation, actually. It, 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 it's an immediate consequence of the theorem, which would be much easier to state because I wouldn't have to explain the quantum fluctuations. Namely, if you actually just looked at the reduced density matrices, right? So there are sort of two natural objects to look at. If you have a general, actually, a general state, right, on the full Hilbert space, uh, initial state psi zero, say, right, you evolve it according to 
So this should be the script H alpha here, so it's purple, just evolve it according to the Schrodinger dynamics with the Fourier Hamiltonian. Uh, we take the corresponding rank one, rank one projection, right? Uh, and now we trace out the Fox space. Right? The variable space is a product, so you take the partial trace of the Fox space, so you just get what you would call the one particle density matrix for the electron, right? the state reduced to the electron. Uh, and uh, the theorem, I didn't write it down here because uh, of lack of space, would simply be that if you start with this initial condition, right, where initially the gamma electron is just the projection onto this psi phi zero, then at any later time, approximately, you'll just be in the state psi sub t, right, obtained by the uh, lambda uh, 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 pecar equation. So there's no need to, to, to talk about quantum fluctuation dynamics if you just look at the electron alone. And similarly, if you just look at the phonons, but not, you know, on the whole phonons, I mean, there, there's a huge number of phonons. There are all the alpha squared phonons, right? But most of them are all in the same state, so to say, class, right? It's a coherent state. So it's sort of a perfectly Bose condensed, if you want. So you only look at that, and then you have the one particle density matrix of this object, right? So here, uh, you, have your, you have your many body state. You look at A dagger A, right? Like it's sort of the two point function, the one particle density matrix which is sort of the operator with this integral kernel here, right? If you look at this object, uh, this is initially simply a, a rank one projection onto phi t, right? Uh, so this is uh, the coherent state. And the theorem will tell you that at any later time, it will also still be a rank one projection, but onto, no, sorry, initially it was phi zero, of course, at a later time it will just be phi t. So also to formulate the theorem for just the one particle density matrix of the phonon field, you would also not have to talk about quantum fluctuations. But if you want uh, a much stronger topology, namely really the uh, L2 diff, so the, the, the full Hilbert space norm, right? All the all the degrees of freedom, then you actually have to take this fluctuation dynamics into account to get uh, the a classical approximation. All right, so this is the main result here. Just a couple of comments about the adiabatic nature of the thing. Right? I already mentioned this, but the, we view our main theorem as a derivation of the lambda pekar equations right, uh, from the actual sort of uh, Froelich dynamics. Right? But the lambda pekar equations, they still hold, they depend on alpha, right? And alpha has to be large for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, 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 approximation to, to be to be accurate, and alpha large means there's a certain adiabatic uh, separation of time scales involved. But in particular, uh, we only prove this for very specific initial conditions for the electron. And right? I emphasized this already. The, phone, the, the polarization field is uh, uh, pretty arbitrary, but the electron is always in the instantaneous ground state. And what our theorem basically says is that it stays there. Right? The polarization field moves. The electron will always be in the instantaneous ground state. That's sort of the adiabatic theorem, if you want. This is sort of the quantum version of the adiabatic theorem. But there's also a purely classical adiabatic theorem, just looking actually at the uh, lambda pecker equations. And this is actually also a non-trivial exercise in, 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 in analysis, which we solved for a couple of years earlier uh, in a paper with Nikolai. Simona and Benjamin, where we just look at the lambda pecker equations and we prove an adiabatic theorem there. Right? And the reason you have to work in some sense is because it's fully nonlinear. Right? It's the, the, maybe the simplest adiabatic theorem you know for quantum mechanics is you have a Hamiltonian, uh, you have an external potential that depends slowly on time. You start initially in the ground state, and then the adiabatic theorem tells you that actually later in time you always be you're always in the instantaneous ground state. Here we're proving the same thing, but for a sort of a full non-linear system, namely these lambda pecker equations, but it says the same thing, right? So, uh, namely, uh, right, uh, you pick the polarization field in such a way right, that I can talk about the ground state of the corresponding should be operator, so that means the energy is negative. We start initially right in the ground state at, uh, at, 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 for this initial field, and then at any later time, we're always in the, ground, in the instantaneous ground state. So or at least the error is small, the error is proportional to 1 over alpha squared on the level of the L2 norms here. The only difference is some phase factor that you can pick up, which is very explicit. It's just the energy right, integrated uh, over time. So this is an adiabatic theorem just purely for the classical uh, equations, but it actually plays an important role also in the then sort of the quantum theorem. Uh, we really we use this also uh, in an essential way.
Right? There's again here a restriction on the time. I mean, the, the time scale is the natural one of order alpha squared, but a priori, we don't really know that, we, we cannot prove this sort of for all times of order alpha squared, and the main reason is actually that we don't know that the object even exists. You see, the initial condition is such that, uh, but that there is, the polarization field is such that there is a bound state of the corresponding Schrodinger operator, but this is not a time independent object. So this will depend on time, and it could be that uh, after some time the gap sort of actually closes, and then I, I, I don't even I don't have a ground state anymore, an instantaneous one, so to say. But the adiabatic theorem always holds as long as the gap doesn't close, right? That's an important condition. Uh, here, basically, in this theorem, we, as a side, we sort of prove that the gap will not close on times of order alpha squared. Right. But a priori, at the time scale, at some point it might close, and that sort of determines the T0 here. Right. But if the gap closes, then of course the theorem has to break down because we don't even know what the psi sub phi should be. Right. Uh, there are special initial conditions where you can actually prove that the gap never closes, and that's uh, true close to the energy minimum. Right. So if I'm close to the minimum, uh, uh, then uh, we can actually prove that the gap never closes and then actually one can extend this theorem uh, to longer time scales. So this is something we did very recently together with uh, Dario and uh, Simon. Okay, so I think that's it. Here is a quick summary and also a couple of open problems. Right, so uh, the main object of study was uh, the, the Fröhlich model for the uh, Polaron. Uh, and uh, the main goal was actually to show uh, the, the, uh, the validity of the classical approximation on the level of uh, the time evolution, namely the validity of these uh, lambda pekar equations to describe sort of as an effective description of the Schrodinger equation for the full uh, Freulich Hamiltonian for suitable initial states, namely uh, two things, the most classical ones, namely product states with a coherent phonofield and the ones that sort of satisfy uh, the adiabatic nature of the problem, namely that the electron should always be in the instantaneous ground state, so to say, of the potential generated by the phonons, uh, to, in order to resolve the separation of time scales. In some sense, that's the only initial condition such that also the electron only moves on the time scale of order alpha squared up, uh, up to a trivial phase, which is not important. Right. So we obtained an approximation, actually a justification of this, appro of this uh, approximation uh, on the full Hilbert space, right? sort of taking all degrees of freedom into account, but for, in order for this to work, you cannot just look at the classical approximation, you actually also have to look at the quantum fluctuations about this classical limit and take this fluctuation dynamics into account if you want an approximation on the full Hilbert space. Right. Whereas if you re look at reduced density matrices, uh, then you actually don't need to talk about the fluctuation Hamiltonian. On, on the other hand, I think we wouldn't know how to prove the theorem for the reduced density matrices directly in some sense. We can prove the weaker result only by first proving the stronger one, going through the fluctuations and then sort of projecting down. Okay. And as I also, I guess, said several times, I mean, the strong coupling limit, which you can uh, uh, study here, it sort of coincides with an adiabatic limit. There's sort of a natural... Uh, uh, Separation of time scales, the phonon field sort of in some sense becomes very heavy, becomes very slow, the electron stays very fast because it somehow the alpha does not appear there. So that sort of this explains the separation of time scales. Um, open problems, uh, uh, there are certainly many, two I listed, I mean, one I already basically refer to if you look at the static problem, maybe you actually want to compute the ground state energy and capture the quantum fluctuations also there, then actually we still we don't know how to do it, we only know how to do it in a simplified setting of a confined system. Right? For the full un unconfined system on the whole space, this is still an open problem. Uh, a somewhat different, a problem of a somewhat different nature, but actually not completely different, is the one for the effective mass. Right? So, so, so there's the notion of an effective mass that the electron, right, as it moves through the system, it drags all this polarization field around, so effectively it becomes very heavy as far as you know, its moment of inertia is concerned. Uh, and uh, it's an open problem to actually get a good bound on the value of this effective mass that the electron uh, acquires. And there is actually a, a concrete prediction that it also goes back to Pekar, I think even, I don't remember, 40s or 50s, uh, based on, this, on, on the classic approximation, basically based on the study of uh, the, uh, the Landau-Pekar equations, that this effective mass should diverge uh, 
for large alpha, in fact, like an explicit coefficient times alpha to the fourth. But uh, this is sort of a, a wild open problem. I think. The, the only thing we know so far is basically that it does diverge as alpha goes to infinity, but there is not even uh, any weight. So this is sort of a big, uh, interesting open problem. Yeah, and I think that was my last slide. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much for this nice talk. Are there any questions from the audience online or offline? Online? No. So then uh, this T naught that appears in the main result that's uh, dictated by the I mean that's what I mean it's it, it's related to this adiabatic theorem. So you want to make sure that this gap stays open. Uh, Actually, it's more than that. <laughs> so so yeah. So this T zero we can get rid of it if we know that the gap does not close. So that's, that's one thing. So for instance, for these initial conditions with low energy, we can prove that. But that allows us to go to all t for other alpha squared, but still not beyond. So the adiabatic theorem we can actually prove longer. I think if the gap doesn't close, we can prove it up to t or other alpha to the fourth or something like that. But the main theorem we can still only prove for t of other alpha squared. So you have to imagine from some grown mal estimate, there is some e to the t over alpha squared or something. So it works for all t of order alpha squared, but t cannot be much bigger than alpha squared because otherwise you have a diverging factor. Okay. Whereas in the adiabatic theorem, we do not have that problem. There we could even go to longer time scales. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I have a bunch of questions. Uh, one is uh, about the university. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so my first question is a very straightforward question is, can you, so, uh, so this is one particle uh, coupled with a electron, uh, with a photon field. Uh, yes. So a natural question is, you can, gen, uh, can you easily generalize this to M particle coupled with a phonon field? Uh, yes, yes, so, 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 so certainly the, so you can uh, discuss, I mean, if you have several electrons, the Hamilton is basically the same, I mean, you still have just one field, you have several electrons, they all have the coupling to the field, right? Uh, and you probably then in addition want to add sort of an instantaneous Coulomb interaction, right? Because the electrons have a charge, so there's also the Coulomb interaction coming from the charge, ir irrespective of the field. So this would be the natural many particle Froelich Hamiltonian. Uh, which certainly is studied in the physics literature. In fact, people are interested in, in uh, what's called a bipolar run, for instance, if you have two electrons, namely, can they actually bind due to the presence of the phonon field, right? The electrons repel each other, they're both negatively charged, but there's an effective attraction through the phonon field. And the question is, uh, can that actually be stronger than the Coulomb repulsion to uh, create these bound states? And, and the answer is yes, there is a parameter regime where you can bind these bipolar runs, for instance. So these questions have been studied. We've also studied, for instance, the question of stability. If you have many electrons, right, so they all interact now, there's, a, there's all this attraction coming from the phonons. It should, not, it should never overcome, so to say, the, the repulsion purely coming from the instantaneous Coulomb interaction. And in some sense, it, it doesn't. There might be some bound states, but there will always be just effectively only finitely many, and, and at least the system is stable. It will not collapse, so to say. They will not get closer and closer. So all these things have been studied. Uh, uh, to a certain degree, also the strong coupling limit, I think, have been studied for more than one electron. Uh, so there are several natural uh, uh, extensions. The dynamics also we have not looked at in the multi-particle case. Okay. So then, then but uh, so here you're assuming that n particle is like uh, of fermionic nature. But suppose I want it to be both zonic nature and couple with a phonon here. Yes, no, here, I don't, you don't have to assume anything. I mean, you can, I mean, these are electrons, so naturally you would want to probably put the fermionic constraint, but mathematically you don't have to. I mean, you can put any constraint or not, none at all. You can certainly study the many body problem, many polaron problem, so to say, for arbitrary statistics. That's not the problem. And then, yeah, finally, my final question. Not really final, but I probably have a couple more. So now, if you couple instead of Say M particle, you couple the entire. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, what I'm always thinking about is you start to say, you uh, compensate in the excitation, and you look at the corresponding uh, Fox space for that, and it's actually a tensor product of a 
of a fox face generated by the condensate tensor of a fox face generated by the pump, uh, I can't remember the name now, the excitation, but for a low enough, uh, for a low enough, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, momentum, it's, a, it's basically a phonon field uh, for the excitations, coupled with the, so I just wanted to know whether you, maybe my question is, can you actually start with a many body uh, boson, uh, bosonic system and actually justify the thrillic, uh, thrillic of uh, Hamiltonian approximation to a many body? Yeah, okay, so that last, okay, I'm not sure I understood all the previous part, but I think I understand the last question. <laughs> so yes, so of course the Froelich model is an effective model, right? Uh, to just, so I don't think there's any rigorous justification, so to say, for it, right? I mean, it's very complicated because you really have to model probably this crystal structure, the fluctuations, I mean, how these dipole moments form, and also if you really go down to the microscopics, right, of having, you know, a crystal of some, you know, uh, some kind of some atoms probably things of that sort it's probably very complicated I could imagine that maybe you could try to derive it from something a bit more fundamental but deriving it sort of from the true if you want Schrodinger equation that just involves you know electrons and protons then it's probably too complicated in any case I, I'm not aware of any sort of derivation of the Froelich model from some, some more fundamental model but uh, it's certainly a very good question I mean, this is clearly an effective model and should be derivable from something more uh, fundamental. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Very naive question. If one were to write the Frehley Hamiltonian in physical units, where alpha would alpha be h bar really? I mean, maybe one over h bar. No, or? No, 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 okay, no, no, not no, really no. related. No, alpha is actually some material. I mean, it's sort of a dimensionless constant. It's a material, so it depends on, you know, the, the, whatever it's called. The, I mean, it's basically the polarizability of the medium. That's how you can think about it in natural units. So it's a dimensionless quantity. And you can look it up simply what it is for different materials. I've seen a table where it ranged from, I don't know, 1 to 10. It's certainly not, you know, 10 to the 6. But I think in physics, 10 is sometimes already considered large. So it's a parameter that I think you cannot easily vary. I mean, a, a given material will have a certain parameter. If you, you know, manage to maybe what you maybe could try to find different materials that have a higher alpha, but it's not something you could easily tune. I think it's simply a material parameter. I just out of curiosity, a question about this effective mass that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So how do you define this in the ah, setting, okay. and in what sense is yes, it effective? So, yes, so I can. Put that here. In order for everybody to see, can you stop sharing? Ah, stop sharing. Okay, I stop sharing so that you can see the board. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, quick, quick definition, right? So, so we have the Froelich Hamiltonian H, and uh, it uh, commutes with the total momentum, right? Because it's translation invariant. So. Therefore, sort of out of abstract nonsense, if you want, you can always factor it. I mean, you can always think of P as being fixed, right? I mean, you diagonalize them simultaneously, which would sort of say that you can write it as a uh, um, direct integral, so to say, over, uh, you can sort of fiber it. You fix the total momentum P and you define the Hamiltonian in the sector where the total momentum is P. You can reduce, so to say, this one or these three degrees of freedom and just talk of, and, and H is naturally a direct integral over such HPs, right? And then you can define simply a natural dispersion relation. The energy as a function of P, it's simply the infimum of the spectrum of H sub P. So in other words, you define the energy, the lowest energy among all states that have momentum P, right? That's, that's all I'm saying, right? So you have this natural uh, object and then the effective mass is simply defined that once you have that, you can look at what this is for small p. I mean, it will have some value at zero. That's the total ground state energy, which is not important for, for the effective mass. But then you expand it for small p, and you simply call the, it will be quadratic, and the coefficient here in front, well, you call one over twice the mass. Because you just think, if you had a, a, an elementary particle of mass m, right, in non relativistic uh, uh, quantum or general mechanics, but right? it's, its kinetic energy is p squared over twice the mass. So, of course, this is never exact, so this will be sort of, there will be lower order corrections 
as sp goes to 0. But this is basically the definition of the effective mass. So we say it behaves like a particle, which kinematically sort of behaves like a particle that had a momentum, uh, uh, had a mass m. Right? And the reason it's difficult, at least from a variational perspective, is that it's really defined by an energy difference, right? You have two objects which you both don't know. We might have some asymptotic, some bounds on this, but bounds don't help you to get, in some sense, you want to bound on a derivative or a second derivative. It's, it's really the second derivative of E of P at P equals zero that you want to control. And you can never control this by just having bounds on the energy, right? That's, I think, the main reason why it's difficult to get in your, your hands on this, because you don't really have a variational formulation of this. Uh, mass. You have a variation formulation of E, but you need two derivatives of E to get your to get the mass. Thanks very much. So then let's thank again our speaker.